Wing Leader Victories 1940 and 1942, a new game by GMT, a game of air combat in World War II, and it is a design by Lee Bramicombe Woods, a very well-known and well-respected designer, especially for uh, games of air combat. That's really his thing and he's known for games that are highly detailed not necessarily the most user-friendly games out there definitely not games for beginners and also in many of these games uh, you have situations that are really not solo friendly so I was pretty happy when I found out actually Wing Leader is 100% solo friendly it is probably the most solo friendly of his designs that I've seen so far no hidden information and a lot of other elements that make it such that you can enjoy the game playing it all by yourself playing both sides at the best of your possibilities lots lots of things that i want to say about this design so let's get started with the main part of the review so let me show how the game works the map for the game is a single large sheet of paper, not too colorful, not many landscape features as it is pretty common in air games because, well, it's representing the sky. Actually, there is an important landscape feature here, which is the terrain. What is unusual about the configuration of this map and the game in general is that actually you're not seeing things from the above, top down, like it happens in so many uh, war games about about air combat but you're seeing them laterally imagine that you're seeing a 2d platform in which some airplanes will enter from here some other ones from here and so changing altitude means that you're going towards the, uh, that side of the map if you're climbing or the side of the map with the ground if you are diving so this is an unusual thing other than that the map is pretty neutral with some uh, indications, with some letters printed here to define the position of things on the map. You have numbers here to define the altitude levels, and if you can see them here, you have, for example, altitude 2, 3, 4, and so on and so forth. Up there, in that corner, uh, don't mind these cutters, they shouldn't be here, or actually that's where I usually keep them, so I keep them handy, but they don't really represent anything in the game. But here there is something that is important, which is a display where you place a marker indicating the sun, and that tells you the relative position of the sun, which, relative to the engagement that is happening, maybe above, right upper, right horizon, and so on and so forth. And that means that relative to the position of the aircrafts on the board, there may be effects, say for example, uh, an enemy is coming out of the sun, which is, is reaching you, attacking you, approaching you from the direction which is where you would have the sun. Unless there is... Uh, something that blocks the light of sight, for example, there are clouds. Then if, for example, I'm here and an enemy is here, then the enemy is not out of the sun because the light of sight is blocked. But otherwise, uh, there is that possibility that enemies are coming out of the sun or that in any case the position of the sun will affect several things that happen on the board. <clears throat> Aircrafts. Uh, we want those, right? If we are... Well, fighting in the skies of World War II. Aircrafts are represented by these counters here, which are double-sided, and they may represent the flights or squadrons, depending on the side of the unit. There is no information on the counters per se, meaning not any stats, that's what I mean. The information that you have is the nice art, the model of the airplane, and then a letter that identifies the airplane. Also, I like that these are double-sided, so that if you need to show that they're going in the opposite direction, you simply flip them and now they're flying in another direction. So, but where do you uh, see the information relative to your models? Easy. Each model comes with a card, a nice sturdy cardboard card with the stats of the aircraft. For example, for this model, we have this uh, card here, and this card tells you about 
the uh, speed of the aircraft and the turn value. Interesting enough, speed has nothing to do in this game with movement points. It is simply a stat that you use in combat. The amount of movement points that you receive when you move your aircraft depends on several factors such uh, and mainly the, the overall uh, mission of the aircraft, whether it's a bomber, fighter bomber or fighter and other uh, environmental factors but not speed and turn. Climb, well this yes does represent the number of movement points it takes you to climb up one level and bomb this only applies in certain cases. Fire power, protection and protection these are important stats that you will use during uh, during combat. So and then you on the back you have some nice historical notes. This is how you keep track of some of the information relative to your aircraft. So then you also have for each player a wing display such as this one where you will place markers to um, to connect your counter on the board with a specific area of the wing display. For example this counter here as marked with an A, then I take the A marker, which can be on the alerted or the unalerted side, depending on the situation, and I place it there to indicate that now all the markers that they place here are telling me stuff that happens here, pretty much like blowing up uh, the situation to look at the aircraft more carefully, and that is where I place things, for example, like lost markers, stragglers, um, things like that. If I have a, a green pilot or, or a veteran crew, uh, all sort of markers go there. Low ammo. So this is how probably the sections for your wing display will look like. It's a nice way to reduce the clutter of counters on the board. Because the squares as you can see are not all that big and actually there is no maximum stacking limit so you can have any number of counters or aircraft in a single square so sometimes these squares do get a little clutter simply with the markers as is, I, uh, with the counters as is, I can't even imagine what would happen with the markers there. So here you have the basic concept slash idea. So first you set up the game based on the scenario instructions, so the scenario that you've decided to play, there are a lot of scenarios, and then, well, you start playing. Uh, beginning of each turn you have a phase which is called the tally phase, which is where uh, aircrafts get a chance of tallying enemies. To be able to attack an enemy you need to be in the same space as the enemy and also you need to have a tally on that enemy. Uh, that means that you use these markers that uh, will link uh, the marker to your aircraft, for example that is the B, and here I have a tally B, and I place this on the target of the tally to represent the, uh, the target that that squadron has a tally on. And I can place it there on the marker or on the wing display corresponding in the area for the uh, target of the tally. But how do you establish a tally? Easy, during the tally phase you declare tallies, then you roll a die, and here you have a play rate that allows you to uh, see what you need to do next. You have, you roll a die, you place, you take into account the modifiers, and then if the roll is equal to or greater than the distance to the target, you place a tally marker on the enemy unit. So suppose that I was lucky, I was successful after I placed all of my, I took into account all of my modifiers and ta-da, I have a tally now. After tally attempts have been resolved, you have the movement phase in which the uh, units move. Now, as I said earlier, you do not move units based on some sort of speed value as indicated uh, on the card. It is more about the environment and the mission that the aircrafts have. Bombers, escorts and unalerted fighters receive two movement points. Um, alerted fighters, fighters with intercept missions receive three movement points. Then you have jets that also have four movement points. And um, units that are moving receive an extra movement point if they dive. So if they declare that they're diving at the beginning of their movement, 
they receive an extra movement point, which also gives them an extra speed. Remember, this is not related to movement, but they receive an extra movement point, but of course they have to move down by at least one level during movement. Moving, um, your aircraft may be facing any one of the four uh, sides of the, of the square, or better, rectangle in which you are, or you may face one of the corners, and that means that you can move in one of eight possible directions, across a corner or across a side, and you can move into the square that you are facing directly or one of the adjacent ones. So if I'm facing like this, I can move into one of these. If I'm facing like this, I can move into one of these. You can change orientation before you move um, and if you do it by no more than 90 degrees then you are changing orientation for free. If you do it by more, for example if you want to change orientation by 180, then you have to spend an extra movement point just to do so. Climbing uh, is a little more expensive because you will spend the number of movement points indicated on the card for your model depending on the altitude at which you are. Otherwise, usually movement costs one movement point per rectangle, per square, per area that you're entering, which makes pretty much sense. As you're moving, a couple of things may happen. For example, if you are trying to enter an area with an enemy bomber and there is an escort under certain conditions, the escort may try to intercept you. That is, to resolve, that is the uh, enemy resolves movement before you actually enter the, uh, the space with the bomber, if they are lucky. Otherwise, it may just happen that they don't react at all, or depending on the die roll, because you need to take a check to resolve a reaction, depending on the die roll, you may have a late reaction in which the escort um, reacts after you, as the attacker, have entered the area with the enemy bomber, then the uh, escort moves into that area and attacks you there. And now, Let's talk about combat. We know that that's what everybody wants to know about. Now, to resolve combat, you need to take into account either the speed or the turn value of the uh, airplane that you're using to attack. It is the attacker that decides if this is going to be a fight result on speed or turn. And you simply compare the values of the uh, two aircrafts for the value that we're using. Suppose that we're attacking this bomber here, this fighter is attacking that bomber, and the fighter decides to use speed. Now, speed of 5 versus speed of 3. Now, this is a game based on differential, um, but you need to take into account both the differential of the attacker versus the defender and the defender versus the attacker, which means that the fighter will have a differential of plus two and the bomber and the target here will have a differential of minus two. Usually you find a single differential, but actually here, both the attacker and the defender roll, both the attacker and the defender look at the combat table and they use the column based on their differential, which means in this combat, the attacker will roll on this table and simultaneously the defender will roll on this table. You roll uh, two dice to resolve combat, here you have a nice reminder of that, and then you uh, will apply all of the modifiers that apply, maybe based on speed ratings, uh, for example if you are diving then you get a plus one, if you are climbing minus one, speed and turn ratings, and then other situations depending on various things, for example the quality of your crew, veteran or green, of course that may mean good or bad stuff. You roll on the column and you determine the number of hits that you have inflicted on the opponent, which can be one, two, or more, or of course also zero. So you determine the hits that you inflicted on the opponent, but alas, here's the surprise, the uncertainties of, of air combat. Oh, I should have mentioned there are also more uh, modifiers that only apply to attacker or defender. But once you have determined the number of hits, uh, will this correspond to the number of losses? Who knows? Not necessarily. You need to confirm each hit. For each hit you roll a die, you apply, uh, you add the firepower of the aircraft that is attacking 
or in any case that you're using to resolve the combat. You may apply other modifiers and then you compare that with the protection of the aircraft that you're targeting. Each result which is high, which is lower than the protection of the modifiers have applied, gives no loss. So you had a hit but it results in no losses. If it's higher then you inflict a loss on the opponent and you place such a marker on the wing display of the opponent for of course in the area for the squadron or for the flight that you have attacked and if you actually roll a result that is equal to the protection of the opponent instead of a loss you inflict simply a straggler on the other side of the loss marker you have stragglers they have stragglers have no immediate effect but if you inflict another straggler on an opponent that has a straggler marker you simply flip it and that turns into a loss uh, the scenario instructions will tell you what's the maximum number of losses that a certain group of aircraft can take before the aircraft is kaput. Other important things, after combat is resolved, uh, hits and losses are determined. There is cohesion. This is a mess when you have this kind of thing. So the groups that are involved in the combat may lose cohesion. So it's time to roll on the cohesion table for that. Each group involved in combat rolls uh, two dice, guess what, applies modifiers based on the situations and then you see uh, if there are levels of disorder, of disorganization that you take. So, uh, levels of disruptions I should say. For each level of disruption that you take you get a marker such as this one that you place on your on your wing display and there is a certain level that depends on the type of aircraft after which well that if you reach that level with the amount of disruption that you have then the group simply becomes broken you can't attack you can't do pretty much anything but simply fly back to base Finally, one last thing, uh, you need to take into account ammo depletion. The first time that you are involved in combat, you go to low ammo. The second time you go to depleted ammo, which has, as you can see, negative effects on your performance. It seems incredibly laborious, but pretty much is this. Each turn you try to establish tallies, you move and then you resolve combat and combat he has several steps but pretty much it means both roll to determine hits both roll to translate hits into losses see if there is a cohesion result and um, take uh, uh, ammo depletion into account that is modified the level of ammo depletion done it is really actually pretty quick to resolve for each and every combat that you have on the board this is the basic structure of the game there's a lot more in the game but what i just explained to you are the basic ideas um, and you continue playing like this turn after turn until one of the players has met the uh, conditions, the victory conditions of the scenario, or there are also other ways in which a scenario can end, for example, if no units are left on the board. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. Um, the rulebook is pretty, uh, it's pretty massive, um, but you only need to know the first uh, uh, 31 pages to play the game, which of course is already like six or seven times the length of a rule book that most gamers out there uh, would feel comfortable um, dealing with and even in terms of word gaming when you get around the 30 page mark that is already a game that requires some investment and it is not all uh, that's for the basic rules so then you can add more rules you can have rules for bombing uh, with the basic rules so even bombers just go through the board you don't resolve the actual bombing you have ground unit, flak, uh, special maneuvers like the Lufberry circle, lot, a lot of other stuff, extra weapons, different things, uh, which you can however integrate later. So there are these uh, first 31 pages that you really need to learn before you get uh, started with the advanced rules, uh, but that's pretty good because it's manageable. It's not the shortest rule book out there, but it's definitely manageable if you are a committed war gamer. I wouldn't even say a hardcore war gamer, but a mid-core war gamer, you can definitely do it. 
even actually if you are a little scared by those 31 pages, you can still cut down things. That is, you look at the scenario book, um, you look for some scenarios that do not have complex stuff uh, like different nets of radio. That's another thing I didn't mention. A lot of stuff I didn't mention, but that's the nature of the design. Because if you're not a hardcore gamer, yes, it may take your game or two or three maybe to become fully comfortable. Expect to forget something the first game or two. But when you get there, oh, this is an experience that really is worth it. Let me say it without any ambiguity. This is a phenomenal game. This is an absolutely superb game. I give it my highest endorsement already. Yes, it looks a little strange with 2D platformer thing. I was a little um, skeptical about that. No scale, so you do not know exactly um, the distances, etc. in the world represented by the scenario. And there is a little abstract quality there, like you do not see the actual maneuvers, you do not see as you are turning around, as your uh, aircrafts are fighting, dog fighting, there is a uh, rule about um, about both sides get it, accepting uh, this tight kind of combat in which both players are committing aircrafts there. Maybe one of them wants to escape, then there's a role to save that happens, but if they want both of them to commit, then you have a dogfight situation in which airplanes are simply sitting there in the same in the same uh, box and then you roll dice to resolve that. At the level of, of, of uh, zooming in that you have here you do not have all that detail but everything actually is abstracted really well because you still get a lot of the sense of how different aircrafts work in different ways, they have trouble moving in certain ways, they have great power but not much quote-unquote armor, not much protection, they can deliver some mighty punch but they also go down more easily, or the other way around you have this clumsy slow bombers that as it very well should be they're like slowly crawling across the board and there is this swarm of little mosquitoes and other small uh, airplanes going around and just hitting them from all directions uh, fires that explode uh, bullets that bounce off oops do not get uh, to damage a lot of uncertainty, yes, uh, you may have a powerful situation that took you half of the game to set up, then your fighters go in the mess, they get intercepted, uh, they get hit heavily and they maybe lose cohesion and that's it, they just get lost in the sky. Um, and they end up uh, having to leave the board. Or, quite the contrary, you have the ace pilot or the green pilot that gets incredibly lucky and just goes in, delivers a mighty blow that just brings a lot of destruction. There is a level of uncertainty that you would expect from this design, but there is so much historical uh, detail that has been abstracted and hardwired in the rules, in the tables, in the system of modifiers especially, uh, and in the cards with the stats, that actually, once you get the basic ideas, you really do not have to work very hard to make the design work. Um, it may feel fiddly a little bit at the beginning, but the, the design soon becomes a second nature, and then you're just really in a sense, you know when writers tell you that the characters are telling them the story? I feel like this is something similar um, that you have in this design, in which different aircrafts and the position and simply the situation, in a sense, drives the story. But it is not that you feel like you're simply um, like being a tool of the design, that the design plays itself. You still make decisions that are incredibly interesting and tough and engaging, but the design also has a sort of like vitality of its own that really um, creates a story that surprises you all the time while still making sense even though some parts of the story may be completely crazy because of some crazy uh, roles. If I were to draw comparison as strange as it may look the two games that uh, this game makes me think of are B17 and B29. Okay they're solo game uh, I mean intrinsically solo game, whereas this is a soloable game. Um, but in a sense, these two classic games have a high degree of abstraction. Uh, you don't get to 
choose every single maneuver and you have several tables and you have a little bit of procedural uh, procedural element that you have to go through as a result the overall steps uh, but those steps do not feel like they are really uh, burdening the design they're making it uh, heavier cumbersome simply they allow you to experience the theme in what feels so after the first game or two something incredibly fluid feels incredibly natural and the same I've had here with Wing Leader. I don't have to worry about how many hexes I move before it can turn by 45 degrees. Um, I don't have to worry about all the technicalities that I have in so many other air games. I love air games, but of course there is the entire uh, element of the physics of the of the theme that or the. That's an element that is very hard for designs to incorporate elegantly. Anything this game does succeed in that. That is, you have procedures which may feel scary at first, but are not, and then simply allow the game to proceed at a phenomenal pace. It moves smoothly. It moves fast. You resolve actions uh, very in a very natural, spontaneous way. You don't you don't feel like um, the the mechanics are. Uh, taking too much of a of a big role in the experience you really see the forest instead of the trees you see the overall movement you see the overall picture and then of course you zoom in when you're resolving uh, the actions of every uh, of every aircraft but you still retain this flavor this big sense of a battle and in this i think this design is really remarkable because you do get the sense of the single dog fight you do get the sense of single maneuver but you do not lose the picture the big picture because of that frankly i'm absolutely ecstatic about this game i really didn't know much about it before i tried it uh, i knew the name of the designer so i knew he was one that i could trust but I certainly, when I saw the 2D platform and a couple of other things that were pretty innovative and unusual, uh, I didn't know what to expect. Now I'm absolutely excited about this game. There's a sequel coming out. I can't wait to try it because, frankly, Wing Leader Victories 1940-1942 has been a great discovery for me. I had a heck of a good time playing it and I really hope to give it a try. No, really, this is a really good game. And before I forget, I want to take a second to thank four viewers of my videos that uh, backed my Kickstarter campaign for 2015. The, um, these four brave gentlemen are Alex Troff, John Dietrich, Stephen Kennett, and Darren Belcher. Thank you all for backing my campaign for 2015. Thank you to the four of you. Thank you to all those that backed my Kickstarter campaign. Actually, thank you to all of you, my viewers, for watching my videos and making my video blog possible.